Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar. Um, my name is uh, Nina Bailey, and I'm going to be talking to you today about histamine intolerance. Um, so this is a, a subject that we've been um, coming across more and more, um, certainly over the last kind of six months or so. Um, and as practitioners, you may find that um, you're seeing clients who are coming in and presenting with a variety of symptoms that sometimes might not quite make sense. And so um, the purpose of today's uh, webinar really is to provide a bit of uh, education, I hope, for you to maybe be able to um, identify some of the sort of clues that center around uh, many of the symptoms that are related to histamine intolerance and for you to maybe then be able to sort of like identify the right questions to ask, um, delving back into a client's history just to sort of dig out those clues that might lead you to suspect that there's a histamine problem. Um, so to uh, just to start off really, um, again, when we're talking about sort of anything to do with sort of food issues, um, we obviously sort of have to look at things like food allergies and food intolerances and, and sort of defining really the sort of difference between the two because you might find that some of your clients are coming in and they, they are exhibiting certain symptoms that might make you think that they've got a food allergy. So um, sort of more specifically the non-IgE, so we're talking about more sort of IgG type allergies to food. Um, whereas food intolerances are not really related to the food as such, it's just that we don't have the chemical machinery to be able to deal with that food type. So, you know, this sort of classic lactose intolerance makes us sort of a bit susceptible to sort of symptoms related to dairy intake. Um, and histamine intolerance comes under this um, sort of area of, of adverse reactions to food. So um, with an individual with a histamine intolerance, they have uh, a reduced capacity to break down histamine within the body. And so... Um, just to sort of clarify a little bit more about histamine disorders uh, in general, um, I'm going to be focusing primarily on histamine intolerance today, but there are some other histamine related disorders that might actually flare up. So we've got conditions such as mast cell activation, um, which is actually an inappropriate degranulation of mast cells. So it's not just related to histamine. If we look at what our mast cell spits out, um, generally kind of we're thinking about sort of immune functions and immune reactions. Um, we don't just sort of like look at histamine. We've got all these other sort of pro-inflammatory products that could be related to uh, a variety of sort of inflammatory related system um, uh, symptoms sorry um, and then we've got mastocytosis now this is a, this is actually quite rare and I think it's a genetic sort of um, issue where an individual actually just has too many mast cells okay so that's the kind of sort of histamine disorders that we can sort of look at um, but today we're going to be focusing on histamine intolerance um, and this is very histamine specific so this is a, a like I said it's a, a reduced capacity to deal with histamine that is either being made within the body or being um, brought into the body through through dietary sources so just a quick overview of what actually histamine is for those of you who might not be that familiar. Um, histamine is a, a hydrophilic vasoactive amine um, and we generally think of histamine as playing a role in defense against infection and trauma for example. So it has a kind of a, a an inflammatory role so it's protecting us against infection and trauma um, but it also involved in a lot of sort of physiological processes so it's involved for in digestion for example um, it stimulates gastric acid secretions and um, and it also acts as a neurotransmitter throughout the body. So it has a variety of different functions. And because it has such a number of, uh, a high number of um, biological effects within the body, and these are dependent on um, the receptor location. So there's a number of different histamine receptors, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, and those receptors are identified on different um, tissues and organs, for example. So depending on where histamine is binding, it will have a different biological effect. 
Um, and this kind of leads us with, again, I will clarify in more detail in a moment, but the variety of these histamine receptors can start to sort of build this picture for us of why histamine um, histamine intolerance can lead to such a, a variety of different, quite often seemingly unrelated symptoms in, in a given individual. So histamine is derived from histidine, uh, an amino acid, through the carboxylation process by uh, the enzyme L-histidine decarboxylase, and that's a vitamin B6 dependent um, reaction. Um, once histamine has been formed, it can either be stored, generally in mast cells, or it can um, undergo rapid uh, deanimation or demethylation. And we have two key enzymes here. So we're talking about diamine oxidase or histamine N-methyltransferase. And these are the two enzymes that are responsible for ensuring that histamine doesn't accumulate unnecessarily. Histamine intolerance itself is dose-dependent condition. So the more histamine you have, um, the more histamine accumulates. Um, and then if we have a reduced capacity to break down histamine, then we, we see this sort of histamine intolerance. So it's a reduced, uh, it's an increase with a reduced decrease, if that makes sense. So these are our two enzymes that are primarily involved um, in regulating histamine. So we have histidine at the top. Uh, gets converted to histamine, like I said, by histidine decarboxylase. And then we have two enzymes. So um, DAO, um, with the number two just above it, um, this is the enzyme that is produced primarily in the gut. Um, and it's involved primarily in degrading histamine that has been brought in through the diet. Um, there and on the other side, we have HNMT, um, and this is an intracellular enzyme. So it's more responsible for breaking down histamine um, at the site of, of action, as it were. Um, and quite interestingly, um, these uh, enzymes, their, their respective reaction products can result in a negative feedback loop. So they can actually be inhibited to some extent in themselves. Um, and then... Uh, we have another enzyme called MAO, so monoamine oxidized, which is very similar to DAO. Um, and uh, monoamine oxidized inhibitors, as you're probably quite familiar with, is a class of antidepressants. Um, MAO and uh, MAOIs were originally um, sort of brought to the market as antihistamines, and it wasn't it was realized over a period of time that actually using monoamine oxidized inhibitors actually improve people's moods. So we think of them more now as antidepressants, but they're quite often used in um, some conditions such as fibromyalgia quite successfully. Um, and part of their actions is believed to be through um, regulating histamine. Okay, so, uh, so these are our two enzymes. And just another slide here to just sort of clarify a little bit more. Um, so as I said, the primary function of DAO seems to be within, uh, seems to be uh, centered around the elimination of excess histamine and controlling the amount of histamine that enters the body from the digestive tract. So it's made primarily in, in places like the small intestine and the colon and so on. Um, it's made within the enterocytes, so these are the cells that line our, our, our gut lining. So any, uh, any kind of inflammation or any damage that you do to your gut can have an impact on DAO um, production and activity. So if you suspect that there may be a little bit of leaky gut or any kind of um, gut inflammation, then it's uh, worth considering um, a little bit of gut healing there. So some glutamate, um, things like vitamin A, vitamin D, um, probiotics. Again, I'll, I'll clarify again uh, a little bit more later on in the webinar. Um, but there's, So there are lots of reasons why we can have reduced DAO activity. Um, HNMT, uh, as I said, primarily functions at the level of the histamine receptor where it terminates the biological acti activity of histamine 
um, within this sort of range of organs. So when we're talking about histamine intolerance, uh, a lot of the sort of focus tends to be on activity of DAO rather than a HNMT. Um, and I've included this slide because I think that uh, sometimes I think visuals can, can say a thousand words. And I think it really kind of clarifies just the relative importance of the different locations of different histamine receptors. Um, and as I said, somebody can be coming into clinic and they can be presenting with a wide, wide variety of symptoms, anything from saying, oh, I get these terrible headaches or you know, my skin flares up or I'm not sleeping well. Um, you know, all of these sort of various symptoms that can quite often not be necessarily related. But then if we delve down and have a little look further, we can actually see that there's this link between um, different receptors and histamine. Um, and so it's, it's worth certainly kind of exploring that kind of area. And then we will have a look at things like um, those factors that reduce our capacity to make um, histamine degrading enzymes and how that kind of fits in. So what we need to be doing is really having a, a deep, uh, deep dive into our client's history. So what, what level of activity have they had in the past or what are they doing now? Um, are they taking antihistamines? Are they taking meds that are going to inhibit enzyme activity? Do they have well-functioning guts? What are all the processes and what are all the, the interactions that are going to provide you with the information that may be um, lead you to suspect that there may be a histamine intolerance or a histamine um, issue in a particular client. Um, so as I said, we have all of these variety of symptoms. Some of them can be quite unrelated, um, but these are just a kind of a list really to, to give you an idea of some of the common symptoms that can be associated with histamine tolerance. So some of the kind of classic, very visual ones are things like skin issues, um, we have areas uh, sort of related to cardiovascular health um, and the chest area, so things like asthma. Um, and in addition to this, we've got factors that sort of uh, that are um, associated with sort of mood, um, even things like sort of inattentiveness, uh, anxiety, um, sleeping issues, so insomnia or waking earlier. And, and this is all, again, sort of related to histamine. And, and if we sort of have a look at how histamine acts, we can start to sort of clarify some of the sort of, or relating through back to some of these symptoms. So histamine, for example, affects the sleep-wake cycle, tends to promote wakefulness. Um, and this is why if we take antihistamines, for example, which act on um, um, H1 and H2, the receptors, we can we can see sort of, sort of uh, how antihistamines can start to make us a little bit drowsy, for example. So that's one of the side effects of taking an antihistamine. We've then got symptoms that are related to our digestive tract, for example, and I've touched a little bit on um, things like leaky gut or inflammation within the gut. Um, and it's actually quite interesting that uh, a lot of people with uh, pre-existing gut issue. So if somebody's uh, suffering from IB, IBS or IBD, for example, they may well uh, have um, histamine issues related back to their inability to produce um, DAO. So if we think about things like leaky gut, if we think about sort of inflammation within the gut, we know that that um, can lower somebody's capacity to produce digestive enzymes. Um, and it's very similar for DAO as well. So it's the same kind of principle. If you're damaging your enterocytes, then you're damaging your productive capabilities for producing enzymes that are made by these cells. So again, supporting an individual with sort of um, digestive enzymes can help as well. Um, if you are not absorbing properly because you've got compromised gut cell membrane integrity, then you are not going to be introducing the correct variety of nutrients that are required for 
um, normal functioning of these enzymes as well. So for example, um, histamine degrading enzymes are dependent on nutrients such as copper, vitamin C, B6, magnesium. Um, so we need to make sure that um, our client is getting a, a good variety of micronutrients and that their absorption capacities are, are working well as well. Um, other typical kind of symptoms, again, sort of very obvious ones, are things like flushing of the face, um, headaches, dizziness, tiredness, fatigue. Um, some of the sort of symptoms that are related specifically to women um, are those related to their, their menstrual cycle, so severe period pains. Um, and this is, uh, again, I will, I will clarify the role of estrogen in just a moment, but this is all sort of related to the relationship between histamine and um, estrogen. Quite often what you will find is that uh, if a client is coming to you and they've had these sort of symptoms and they've been progressing through the years and yet they will say to you, well, you know, when, when, when I was pregnant, my symptoms improved, but then after my pregnancy, my symptoms came back again. This is all related to DAO activity. Um, when, when we're pregnant, the uh, placenta upregulates DAO activity and this is to prevent protect the developing fetus from high levels of histamine. Um, so we get massive amount of, of DAO production. Um, so then both mother and the baby feeling okay. Um, soon as uh, baby's born, everything goes back to normal. So poor mum starts to get these symptoms come back again. So that's a bit of a clue there um, if, you're, if you're looking back at somebody's sort of case history. Um, if you are interested in doing a little bit of reading after the webinar, then I would suggest having a look at this paper. It's very well known. Uh, anybody who knows anything about histamine intolerance or has been to any kind of histamine intolerance lecture or webinar before will probably have come across this, this diagram. Um, but again, I've, I've kind of uh, popped this one in because it's a good, clear uh, overview of histamine um, and its related histamine receptors and how they then affect various tissues and, and, and organs and the, the symptoms that we kind of see from those. Okay, so just a, a, a couple of lines really on the role of genetics. Um, so histamine metabolizing enzymes are responsible obviously for uh, histamine degradation. Um, there are a number of genetic variants of these enzymes and um, for somebody who may be predisposed so somebody who has got a SNP for example that will reduce their capacity may be at a, a, a higher risk of developing a, a histamine intolerance um, for example the genetic variant um, C314T um, on HNMT can actually reduce the activity of this enzyme between 30 uh, and 50%. However, and uh, the, the following line is um, highlighted really because it's come from one of the papers below it. Um, it's unlikely that genetic variants on their own are going to be enough to induce a state of histamine intolerance and that actually it's more likely that you've got a little bit of genetics and then with all your environmental and dietary factors coming in, if we're not putting in the right foods, if we're damaging our gut lining, if we're taking lots of medications that are going to irritate our gut lining, so non-steroid anti-inflammatories, if, um, if we upset the natural balance of our gut flora, for example, um, then we are going to sort of aggravate that capacity to degrade histamine. So genes are likely to um, play a role, but on their own, it's unlikely that they are going to um, really uh, play a role in sort of histamine intolerance. You have to put everything on top of it, if you like. So while some people will kind of suggest that maybe um, genetic testing is uh, a useful tool, I would suggest that um, you're probably 
already exhibiting symptoms. So you know that that person is going to be histamine intolerant. What I'll talk about in a moment is possibly the benefits if we're doing any sort of functional testing is to maybe look at enzyme activities themselves. Um, so the SNPs may provide you with some information, but it's not necessarily going to change your course of recommendations. Okay, so I mentioned that DAO was the sort of enzyme culprit when it comes to um, sort of histamine related issues. Um, and DAO is the enzyme that is responsible for degrading histamine from the diet. Um, if we look at histamine rich foods, um, we're covering anything through from sort of fermented alcohol beverages, fermented foods, um, dried fruits, smoked foods, nuts, walnuts, some, some, there are some uh, food items that are going to be particular triggers for people. And again, um, mentioning early on uh, about histamine intolerance being a bit dose dependent, um, you'll also find that the the symptoms and the foods are never going to be the same between person and person. Everybody is very unique. So um, when we look at um, asking somebody to keep a food diary, for example, for you know a couple of weeks or you know even a few days, can give you some kind of insight. Um, what you might find is that that some triggers are particularly. Um, sort of heavy for some people um, and some foods they can tolerate quite well so it, it's, it's quite interesting when we sort of look at the different foods um, but the, uh, the the link through from the sort of fermented aspect is the role of bacteria so a lot of bacteria are going to be histamine producers for example so anything that is sort of like leftover meats or you know sort of um, aged meats for example are going to be naturally producing histamine so you're introducing histamine um, into the diet and obviously um, a lot of sort of uh, protein foods are going to be high in histidine as well, which is our precursor. We then also have histamine releasing foods. So anything that's going to stimulate this sort of um, sort of release of histamine into the, into the system. Um, and again, there's a, a huge variety of different foods um, that we need to really be looking out for. Uh, and then at the bottom there, I've sort of listed as well, things like artificial preservatives and dyes. Um, and there are a lot of foods that may not necessarily be histamine containing foods. Um, but again, if we're looking at processed and refined foods, a lot of these have got sort of chemicals that are either, um, sometimes they can be naturally occurring in foods, um, but then we have the sort of uh, the, the level of food additives that have been added as part of the processing. Um, and so we need to be very careful about sort of like looking at labels. So it's not necessarily always the food that we're eating. It's all the nasty stuff that we've added to the food to increase its sort of shelf life and things like that and to make it make it not go not turn bad quite so quickly. Um, and then we have our high histidine foods. So these generally tend to be sort of high protein foods. So meat and, and soy protein, um, some cheeses as well. So anything that's going to be high in histidine is going to um, give you the sort of chemical, uh, sorry, the, the, the building blocks to produce histidine. And again, when we're talking about dietary intake, then we also need to be looking at the sort of gut flora as well, because the gut flora is going to play this role in um, converting histidine to histamine. So talking back about sort of a little bit of gut dysbiosis, for example, if we haven't looked after our, our gut flora, if we've overused our antibiotics, if we've taken too many non-steroid anti-inflammatories, all of these sort of factors, a little bit of leaky gut, can all um, have uh, an impact on the type of bacteria that are sitting within our guts. And um, some bacteria are going to be DAO producers, some bacteria are going to be histamine um, degraders, and then you're going to have, you know, the opposite. So you're going to have gut flora, gut bacteria that are actually going to be increasing your histamine load. And so if we don't look after our gut flora properly, then again, we, we can start to see how um, the foods that we eat 
can then have an impact on, on our histamine load. Um, and then there's a number of medications that are known to either reduce the activity of DAO or DNMT. Um, and again, you know, I've, I've already mentioned my non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. So these will have an impact on these enzymes. But again, uh, overuse of things like ibuprofen and aspirin can over time irritate the gut lining, um, re, uh, sort of reduce sorry, the, uh, the natural ability for us to produce these enzymes as well. Um, and so that's going to exacerbate sort of symptoms. We've got antidepressants, we've got immune modulators, um, and then down on the list here, we've actually got our antihistamines. Um, and what you might find is uh, you have a client that comes to see you and, you know, they, they, they're talking about these symptoms. A lot of the symptoms can actually sort of be, be um, mistaken for allergies. So the sort of runny nose, the dripping eyes and things like that. Take an antihistamine, kind of clears up a little bit, which may mislead them into thinking that it's just a bit of an allergy to something. Um, the issue with using antihistamines is that they don't actually deal with the histamine problem. So they're not getting rid of histamine. They're actually just stopping histamine from binding to the receptors. And antihistamines tend to be um, um, histamine receptor specific. So for example, H1 and H2. If you are blocking H1 and H2 and you're not actually degrading histamine, it's just going to float around the body and go and find somewhere else to bind. So it's just going to cause symptoms elsewhere, really. Um, and uh, just kind of overusing histamine, antihistamines, for example, um, over a period of time, the body just feels like there is a lack of histamine. So it just produces more histamine. So I, actually using antihistamines can provide some kind of temporary relief to symptoms, but over time, it's just really not a good idea at all. Uh, as I've just said. Okay, so with histamine intolerance, over-the-counter over the and prescription antihistamines can often lead to worsening of symptoms. Okay, so yes, I've touched slightly on gut flora and dysbiosis. Again, an increase in histamine uh, carboxylase containing bacteria can increase the amount of histamine, histidine from dietary protein that converts to histamine. Um, so we need to look after our gut, uh, our gut flora. I've talked about how uh, use of antibiotics um, can disrupt the number of DAO uh, inhibiting bacteria or histamine liberating bacteria. Um, and if somebody has got use of antibiotics uh, within their sort of case history, it can take years. It can take years sometimes to um, get our normal gut flora back. So if, especially in people who maybe don't supplement with a good probiotic after they've used antibiotics. So the, the changes that we see in gut flora after an anti, a course of antibiotics can stay um, dysregulated or disrupted for, for, a, for a number of years um, in some cases. So then we've got things like leaky gut, um, um, small intestine overgrowth of, of various bacteria can all again contribute to histamine intolerance um, and then we've got things like the bacteria that are used to naturally ferment foods like yogurt and fermented foods can exacerbate histamine production so there's certain strains of bacteria that are known um, to um, exacerbate uh, histamine production which is a bit kind of um, tricky to be honest, because uh, in a lot of cases, we would suggest that probiotics, fermented, naturally fermented foods are generally very good for most people, um, but not quite so for the histamine intolerant individual. So again, I'll, I'll have a chat about that in a moment. Um, and just a slide really to sort of emphasize the fact that there are a variety of histamine um, DAO producers, so um, microorganisms that are capable of degrading histamine. Um, and I picked these out from a, a couple of uh, papers here. Um, 
but these aren't ones that I would naturally be very familiar with myself, I must admit. But it does tend to imply that if you get your probiotics right, um, then we can actually help reduce total histamine load by carefully formulated probiotics. Um, okay, so I touched on estrogen a little bit earlier. Um, estrogen excess, so you may have somebody coming to see you, got all the signs of symptoms of being a bit estrogen dominant. Um, issue with estrogen is that it downregulates DAO. If you downregulate DAO, you'll get an elevation in histamine. Um, estrogen also sensitizes mast cells to release histamine. Um, so anybody who's sort of taking hormonal birth control pills, for example, anybody who's got a bit of estrogen excess, a little bit low on progesterone, may have uh, more of an issue with histamine. Certainly if there's other factors going on there that would, would lead you to suspect that there's an histamine intolerance. Um, generally, DAO is higher in the luteal phase when progesterone is higher. So symptoms tend to be... Um, slightly better in the luteal phase. Um, and again, just to sort of re-emphasize that the placenta produces higher amounts of DAO. So symptoms of histamine intolerance tend to subside during pregnancy and then reappear um, after pregnancy. So some, some quite nice clues um, that, that can be sort of dug out from people's case studies. Um, uh, just a couple of slides or one slide on um, stress and histamine. Um, so we're very familiar with sort of serotonin and the gut and the immune function in the gut. The p impact of mental stress, we know that stress results in activation of the HPA axis. The more histamine is released, the more cortisol it takes to control the inflammatory response and the harder that the adrenals have to work for to produce more cortisol. So quite often where there's a histamine issue, we also see a little touch of maybe adrenal fatigue. Um, stress induces gastrointestinal function, increases mast cell activation. Okay, we also get higher levels of histamine during sort of fight or flight. Again, this kind of relates back to the role of histamine in H3, for example, histamine receptors, promoting this sort of wakeful firing um, pattern. Um, so all these kind of areas that are associated with mental stress that can have, a, have an impact on histamine. So aggravate our histamine intolerance. And we also know that physical stress can have an impact on, on the release of histamine. So any kind of excessive physical um, or um, yeah, so sort of physical exercise and things like that, physical strain, exertion, or even sort of injury can trigger the release of histamine. So, you know, we need to be a little bit careful on, on just how much sort of physical activity we're doing. But then again, if somebody's coming to see you and, and they've got these histamine intolerances, they may actually have kind of made these associations to, you know, oh, went to the gym the other day and I felt awful afterwards. Um, we've also then got things like L-carnosine, which is released during exercise. This is converted to histamine as well. So the kind of um, the, the, the recommendations that we would be looking at um, not only kind of factor around what we can do from a dietary approach, but there's also kind of like, you know, some 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 advice that needs to go through to looking after our stress pathways. So not just sort of mental, but also physical stress as well. Okay, so everybody's tolerance to histamine is unique, as I said. Um, using a timeline uh, approach is a very useful tool for identifying suspected histamine intolerance. So if you're taking your, uh, if you're taking your client's history, we can then have a look through this to see where there may be the sort of clues that would lead us through to making this kind of um, um, link through to histamine. So, okay, let's have a look at their diet. You know, what are they doing? What are their habits? Do they eat a lot of histamine rich foods? Do they eat a lot of histamine releasing foods? What about their medication history? Um, are they using a lot of, you know, prescription drugs that we know interfere with the, with the breakdown of histamine? 
Do you suspect that there's a touch of dysbiosis? Do they have a bit of leaky gut? As I said, if you've got a client coming to you and they've already got gut issues, a little bit of IBS, for example, is going to lead you to suspect that maybe some some um, gut um, healing may be useful in this client. What's their stress exposure? Are they stressed on a on a daily basis? I mean, we're all stressed. So, coming into work in the morning in the in the down the A14, for example, is causing me quite considerable stress at the moment. Um, what's their um, physical stress as well as their mental stress? Um, quite often, you know, where there's stress, we we get adrenal fatigue. We can have thyroid problems. All of these can be dragged in to help build this picture that may then help us to identify whether there may be an issue with histamine. Um, again, as I said earlier, histamine and nutritional deficiency. So there's various cofactors that are required. So DAO, for example, needs vitamin B, uh, vitamin B, vitamin C, uh, copper. B vitamins are um, specifically required for HNMT activity because it's, it, the process is via methylation step. So we need, we need plenty of SAMI, for example. Um, so if we are, are not consuming our nutrients in adequate amounts, then we could be reducing the capacity of these enzymes. Um, if, our, uh, if we're consuming them, but we're just not absorbing them, then it's going to have an impact on our enzyme function. So we need to be looking at the diet as a whole. So this is where maybe a little touch of supplementation might be useful um, in some cases, if, if, we, if we suspect that maybe there's some nutritional deficiencies here. Right. Okay. So hopefully that's kind of built up a little bit of kind of education, what to look for, what to identify, what to ask. Um, um, so we now are confident in saying, I think you might have an issue with histamine. So what do we do about it? Okay. So the, the, the following slides are really going to um, give you some information on the, the, the steps to take when um, managing somebody with histamine intolerance. So the first thing that we really need to do is identify histamine foods and hist histamine liberating foods. And we need to, to withdraw those from the diet from that person. Um, uh, there have been some studies that have shown that um, uh, a four week Histamine, low histamine diet can be quite successful in reducing symptoms. I would suggest anywhere between one to three months um, with improvements often observed between maybe four to six weeks. Um, but that's the kind of key one, really. Um, but we also want to stabilize histamine release and accelerate histamine degradation because whilst we're removing the histamine foods, you're never going to be able to remove all the histamine from the diet. Um, and again, I'm going to be talking about sort of nutritional adequacy of our diet as well, because obviously with a histamine, any sort of elimination diet is going to be quite restrictive. Um, so our diet is not necessarily going to be histamine free. So we need to make sure that we stabilize histamine release and accelerate histamine degradation. Um, and as I've also said earlier, some of the histamine that is, is within the body is obviously going to be made endogenously. So it's not all coming in from the outside. Um, one thing that we could do is supplement with DAO. Um, and this is particularly useful for individuals who uh, have issues with ingested histamine. Now, the only, or I was going to say only, but there's a couple of issues with DAO supplementation. One of them is that uh, I don't think you can get it in the UK. I have always had to purchase mine from um, a very well-known website who then dispatch it over, usually from the USA. So you can buy it from the USA. You can have it sent over here. It's quite expensive, and sometimes you get a little bit of... Um, if they stop it at customs, you end up having to pay stamp duty or tax duty or whatever it is. But you can purchase DAO, but you can't get it in the UK. Um, the other side of DAO supplementation is that it works only in the gut. So it's not absorbed. It doesn't get sort of into the systemic circulation. So it'll only degrade histamine that you are bringing in through your diet. 
Okay, so then we can uh, look at identifying, because it's all very well sort of, you know, doing all this sort of removing the foods and everything, but we have to identify what is the cause of our histamine intolerance um, other than genetics. So I've kind of touched on, right, um, on their own, the genes, not convinced. I don't think there's a huge amount of evidence to say that the genes themselves are going to lead to histamine intolerance. If you've got the, if you've got various SNPs that are going to predispose you to histamine intolerance, um, it's then what you're doing, is what you're eating, is what the meds you're taking, is whether you're looking after your guts. It's things like um, chemical sensitivities, heavy metals, amalgams, paints, fluoride all of these things that we're bringing into our body that is going to then even further reduce your capacity to degrade histamine. So we have to identify them and then deal with those. So just a quick um, overview really of the, the low histamine diet. And this is a classic, um, again, anybody who's been to a webinar or talk or seminar or anything on histamine intolerance or this kind of area probably will have come across this very well known randomized double blind controlled trial in which 80% of um, individuals popped onto a four week diet showed um, improvements in, in histamine related symptoms. So we, we know it kind of works. It, it's, it's a useful tool, certainly for helping to identify if somebody really does have a histamine intolerance. Um, adopting a low histamine diet, it's effective and it's also cost viable. So it's not actually really costing anything. Um, the only issue with a low histamine diet is the restrictive nature. Um, and it's also, um, for somebody who's kind of been in a very comfortable pattern of eating as well, um, and quite often, you know, we have people coming in to see us, uh, their diets aren't always uh, nutritionally adequate anyway. I mean, diets can, can be quite varied, but everybody sort of would say, yes, yeah, I think I eat a, a fairly healthy diet. And then when you look at it, you think, well, I, I might disagree with you there. Um, but quite often when somebody has a very set way of eating to suddenly then introduce this, right, you can't eat this, you can't eat this, you can't eat this is a little horrifying for some people, I must admit. So it's got to be something that somebody's kind of prepared to take on board and something that you've got to be prepared to support them through. Um, and as the practitioner, you need to make sure that uh, any sort of new diet uh, proposal that you put across has to be nu nutritionally adequate as well. So if we take out a lot of the foods, then we, we need to make sure that you're still delivering um, optimal amounts of protein, fats, good fats, micronutrients, and so on. Um, so that's a very important thing to, to look at as well. Um, Generally, just a few slides here on sort of what we really need to be cutting out. You know, I've talked about the meat and, and poultry and fish link, um, and that's to do with the kind of, you know, the natural uh, bacteria that are living in these, these, this, this, these kind of foods. Fermented products, again, the bacterial link. Um, um, so again, it's like, you know, the, there's kefir at the bottom there, which, which upsets me slightly, as I've, I've kind of probably already said. But, you know, the, these are it's sort of like naturally fermented foods are what you would generally to people say, oh, you need to get some probiotics in you and um, where's the best place to look? naturally fermented foods in the case of histamine intolerance is, is just really a, a no-go um, milk and milk products that are not fermented you, you can consume um, and there's a link at the end of the webinar as well and the the paper at the bottom here is a good place to go and have a look they they list all the kind of histamine yes and no's when it comes to sort of food food products as well uh, numerous fruits so anything through from sort of raspberries, strawberries, currants, grapefruit, all of these have to be restricted. Um, we've then got a variety of vegetables as well. Uh, this is just a kind of like a, a small list of the foods that we need to be avoiding. Uh, there's a number of seasonings as well. So again, we can start to see how, 
restricted histamine or a restricted diet can be not only restricted in foods, but um, a lot of the, the, the ingredients that we use to flavor foods can be restricted as well. So we can start to see how a restricted diet can be quite tricky for some people. And then a few just miscellaneous items, so typical things like little bits that we tend to add to food. So things like soy sauce, miso, those kind of things. Uh, have to be careful with things like tea, chocolate, cocoa, cola drinks, alcoholic beverages of all times are out. Um, so that there's, there's a lot of foods and drinks and uh, ingredients that, that, um, that we have to really kind of restrict within a, a histamine restrictive diet. I mentioned um, testing for DAO um, earlier, and I think this is this is quite a, a useful tool, um, especially um, if you have a client, for example, who you suspect may have uh, issues with sort of um, um, leaky gut inflammation of the gut, that kind of thing, where uh, you're introducing a gut healing program in there as well. Um, so you're just sort of, you know, uh, I'll talk about probiotics in a minute, which ones that you can use. Um, but if, you, if you're if you incorporating a, a gut healing program as well, because I think that that's really, really important to do. Um, if you want to see if your gut healing you know, um, intervention is, is being successful or not, then testing for DAO activity can give you some information there. There are a number of, of laboratories that offer um, DAO testing, um, and I've dug out a couple, uh, one at the top and one at the bottom there, both home test kits, so uh, very similar to our Optio 3 biomarker test, non-invasive, uh, it's just a little prip, uh, finger prick, and then you, you either put it onto card, a bit like our Opti, or I think some of the new tests are actually sort of, you get a tiny little pot and then you just have to collect three or four drips of blood and then you post that off um, and then you'll get your results. And I think um, 66 pounds, I think is the cheapest one that I found, um, which I think is actually quite good value for money. So um, this is just a screenshot of their uh, results. Um, and again, I quite like this because, you know, sometimes we get, we, we offer sort of functional testing to clients and then we get the results and we have to sit there and try to work out what they mean ourselves. So this is nice and simple. Your result is, is either going to tell you whether histamine intolerance is likely, probable or unlikely. Um, and we're looking for anything over 10 uh, U per mil is would would imply that it is unlikely. So anything under ten would give you a, um, would lead you to suspect that low uh, DAO activity can lead to histamine intolerance. Um, so it can be used before intervention, or it can be used during your intervention to see how that client is getting on in terms of their DAO activity. So if they've got normal functioning DAO, then we can start to think about reintroducing some of our histamine foods. Um, because a, 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 as I might have sort of explained, um, histamine diets, or low histamine diets, sorry, can be very um, nutritionally demanding in regards of the sort of restriction. So as a long-term diet, it could be quite difficult for, for a lot of people. So we would like to be able to think that we can reintroduce our histamine foods at some point. And if our DAO activity is, is, is up, then, then that's the time to consider uh, reintroducing foods. Okay, so here's uh, a slide, just a little bit about probiotics. Um, and I haven't as yet found a particular product with the particular um, bacteria or strains of bacteria that I would say this is a histamine intolerant probiotic product. This is the perfect one. That just doesn't seem to have happened yet. Um, but if you're looking for a probiotic um, to help um, sort of support gut function, then there are a few strains that we can sort of have a look at, and I've listed those here. Probiotics, if they're used appropriately, can be very, very useful. 
um, and part of their usefulness is centered around their ability to shift immune activity. So to drive it more down um, Th1 response rather than the Th2 response. So again, sort of the right type of bacteria, the right type of probiotic can be really useful. You just have to be very careful. So in addition to our low histamine diet, we focus on stabilizing histamine release and accelerating histamine degradation. Degradation, sorry, degradation, degradation. Um, and we do this through, um, or we can do this through supplemental intervention. So if we have a look at some of these as supplements, we can start to see why maybe supplements might be more beneficial. Um, things like polyphenols, flavonoids, really, really useful, anti-inflammatories, antioxidants. Quite often in a low histamine diet, they can be low. So there's a lot of the foods that we're restricting are our polyphenol and flavonoid um, um, deliverers, as it were. Um, we can't rely on fish intake uh, unless you've literally gone down to the seaside, caught your fish, gutted it, eaten it straight away. So our diet is probably going to be quite low on our long chain omega-3 fatty acids. So just supplementing with a good quality omega-3. Um, anybody who has been to any of our hygienist uh, webinars before are probably familiar with the, with the products that we have. So we've got some very good quality uh, omega-3s. We've got our Farmipa Restore, Farmipa Maintain. We have our standard wild fish oil um, which delivers 660 milligrams of omega-3 in one capsule. So that's a good one as well. Um, we need to look at things like cofactors. Um, so specifically, again, talking about copper, vitamin C, vitamin uh, B6. Um, obviously, when we're looking at um, intracellular degradation of uh, histamine, we need to be supporting HNMT. And HNMT is, is uh, incorporated into our um, methylation cycle. So we need to have plenty of SAMI, our universal methyl donor, to be able to um, um, activate HNMT. So, um, and that's how that works in regards to histamine degradation. Um, so if we're not got enough magnesium, folate, vitamins B6 and B12, for example, a little bit of zinc in there as well, then our uh, activity of HNMT may not be functioning quite on par. So plenty of cofactors, plenty of methylation cofactors. And also we need those to support all of these other wonderful pathways as well. Okay, so um, flavonoids, one of the probably the best known flavonoids that is known for its um, benefits for reducing mast cell activity. So it's a mast cell stabilizer is quercetin. We find quercetin in things like apples. So an apple a day, very, very good for us. Might not necessarily keep the doctor away, but um, yeah. So flavonoids. Um, we've got all of these other sort of little bits and pieces in here that we can bring into the diet. So um, naturally occurring flavonoids, very good for sort of mast cell stability, so to reduce our, our histamine release. Um, we've then got other polyphenols, so we've got things like grape seed extract, pine bark extract. Both of these can be taken um, as supplements. They would normally be found in things like apples, pears, grapes, chocolate, wine, and tea, for example. Um, but if you remember, probably things like chocolate, wine, and tea are probably not going to be in your client's diet. So a little bit of nutritional supplementation may not go down too badly there. So grapeseed extract, pine bark extract. Um, and these are doses that I've picked up from some, some, some good quality sites that, um, are focusing on histamine intolerance. So, um, and yes, okay, so reducing histamine release, a number of foods. So, we've got our quercetin, which I was talking about, we've got lutolene, um, we've got resveratrol, curcumin, all of these are um, naturally occurring, obviously, ingredients within foods. Some of the foods that you uh, would find these in may be restricted in this uh, uh, histamine restricted diet. So again, going back and having a little look at, at, at incorporating supplements. So things like resveratrol and curcumin, um, some good quality supplements out there that can be used to sort of boost the diet in um, helping to reduce histamine release. <laughs> 
Um, so um, getting towards the end of the webinar today, um, for those of you who are familiar with um, iGenus, you're probably familiar with some of our products. For those of you who are not familiar with iGenus, um, the majority of our products have been um, developed as uh, anti-inflammatory support. So we haven't actually developed any specific protocol for managing uh, histamine intolerance, um, but we do have some products that you might want to consider. Um, the first of these is our multivitamin and mineral. Um, this is a, a, a product that delivers 22 of our key essential vitamins and minerals. So I've already kind of mentioned things like copper and the importance of B vitamins. So um, folate, B6, B12, and so on, zinc. Um, very, very important for helping to regulate our enzyme activities. Um, our multivitamin and mineral, we use the best quality um, ingredients. So we either uh, go for bioavailability or we go for um, pre-methylated. So our ingredients tend to be in their body ready forms where, where possible. So this is a very good product for topping up your client, especially um, when we're talking about sort of histamine restriction and the importance of nutritional adequacy. So where you may consider that the diet itself might need a little bit of a top up, this is a good quality product to maybe consider. Um, and another product that we would recommend is our Long Vida Optimized Curcumin. So again, we think about histamine intolerance, we can think of it as an inflammatory process in itself. It's an inflammatory condition when we look at the, the, the various symptoms that we're experiencing. Um, curcumin is very well known as an anti-inflammatory, um, working primarily through um, regulating neuro uh, uh, NF kappa B. Um, the issue with curcumin, certainly in standard curcumin supplements and curcumin from the diet, is that it's poorly absorbed, so it's not very bioavailable. Um, you can take uh, curcumin in very high doses, grams a day, and most of it will either pass straight through, or if it is absorbed, um, the liver is very, 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 very good at um, priming it for excretion. Um, so our long vida delivery uh, is quite a clever little delivery system because it, uh, it surrounds our curcumin, um, makes it nice and bioavailable, um, but the most important factor about it is that um, the natural process of absorption bypasses the liver. So our long vida curcumin delivers to, to the lymph rather than the, the circulation. So we get uh, a delivery of what's known as free form curcumin. So curcumin in its active state. So the liver isn't able to prime it for excretion. So uh, not only do we get nice uh, high levels of plasma curcumin, but the curcumin is able to cross the blood brain barrier. So it gives it an additional benefit for sort of mood health and, and um, cognitive health as well. So as an anti-inflammatory, this, this is a good product to, to maybe consider. Um, and then another, uh, an, another product or a range of products is, uh, is our mind care range. So our mind care range is a duo capsule system. Um, one of our capsules, as you can see here, I love a little fish oil, is uh, omega-3 EPA and DHA. It's a little bit of vitamin D and vitamin E in there. Um, it's a one a day. And then the other capsule is a micronutrient containing full B complex. Get a bit of zinc, selenium, uh, vitamin C, and targeted actives. So we've got four different products, and our targeted actives are a little bit different for each one, depending on what you would, what you're sort of looking at. Um, so we've got balance, focus, lift, and protect. Um, and if you're looking for an all-round uh, general kind of support, general top up then um, for, the, for supporting a histamine or low histamine diet, this is probably the best product if you're looking specifically at mind care. So if you're looking at getting a good variety of micronutrients and a good variety um, or a good, a good dose of omega-3, for example, um, then mind care balance is a good one. Um, 
uh, it's a blend of magnesium. Um, we have L theanine and we have the uh, micronutrients that I, I mentioned on the previous slide. So that's a good, good, good product for supporting um, various aspects that could be related to histamine um, activity. Um, the alternative is to take our multivitamin alongside one of our fish oil supplements as well. But, but so it's just really to sort of give you an idea of what's out there and what we've got to offer. Okay, so this is really sort of bringing everything to a close. And again, anybody who's ever kind of sat through any kind of webinar or, or lecture on histamine intolerance will probably have come across this little bucket scenario or analogy of, of, of histamine intolerance. So um, our bucket is our histamine bucket. The more we put in it, or the more we impede our, our, our ability to degrade histamine, the more symptoms we're going to sort of start to experience. And then the factors coming in from the sides are really the, the contributors to our um, histamine filling bucket. So we've got um, things like our gut bacteria, which are, I've, I've spoken to you about, high histamine foods, our degranulators, our liberators, our blockers, and so on. So I think it's just a nice little summary there for you. So that brings me to a close. I hope that um, you've enjoyed the webinar today. Um, if you've got any questions, um, please feel free to get in touch. As I said, there's a little link at the bottom there if you want to go and explore. Um, and we've embedded the, um, some of the papers in the text itself so you can go and look at those. Um, they're all free to download, so it should be easy to access. Um, any questions? Like I say, get in touch. You've got Sophie, my colleague Sophie, who can give you more information on our sort of education side of things um, and our products. If you've got any technical questions, then please feel free to get in touch with me directly. Um, if you've enjoyed the webinar today, we hope to see you again. Um, we have a, a comprehensive list of what we've previous webinars and webinars that are coming up on our website. So um, feel free and drop in and, and have a look on there. Um, otherwise, thank you very much for giving up your lunch hour today. And I will look forward to seeing you all again um, for our next webinar. Okay, thank you and goodbye. <laughs>